But yeah, this is um, this is some work we did recently on uh, using GANs for um, for predicting future images of plant growth, um, which you know is an interesting topic. How you know how much we're going to be doing this in ten years, I think remains to be seen because we you know there's more experimentation to be done. But I think it's an interesting topic, and it's perhaps a little bit of an introduction into GANs for those of you that don't know about them. Um, and do ask me questions about GANs if you have them. I have had a go at various different types of GANs. I I have a kind of begrudging respect for them. They they do seem to work quite well. They're often very difficult to train. So there's lots of you know lots of problems as well that are perhaps not mentioned in the papers that that publish in GANs. But it's still an interesting place to be. Um, right. Let's see if I can move my slides. There we go. Okay. So. This was some recent work we published in Remote Sensing. Now, this work was actually driven by um, Rebel Yazrab, who now works, um, I think, on biological, um, on medical imaging at Oxford. Um, he, he moved since doing this. Um, so, you know, he's the super expert on this study, right? I was, you know, supervisory role. Um, but basically what we did was we, we, we we have a lot of data sets that have been curated from the School of Biosciences on growing Arabidopsis, for example, on agar plates. So on the left hand side, you can see, you know, you've got your grey image, infrared plate, uh, agar, and then just Arabidopsis growing over time. And what we're trying to do is perhaps reduce the experimental, the length of the experimental cycle slightly by predicting the last couple of frames, right? We're not suggesting, I think, that you just could take a very small plant and then just see how it would grow without any kind of knowledge of, of the genetics of that plant or other environmental factors. I think we're just, we're just seeing what will work. This is very experimental work, right? So the results look promising from an accuracy point of view, but as I'll show at the end, there are lots of unanswered questions and, you know, but feel free to answer these questions as well, right? It, uh, it won't just be me doing this. Um, so yeah. Um, all right. So let's let's talk about um, first about where this came from. Rebel was employed in my lab on a project called Root Nav Two. Now Root Nav Two is a um, is a root phenotyping tool which combines deep learning and traditional um, sort of bottom up image processing techniques and actually just more computer science techniques really so this is a pretty standard encoder decoder network that takes an input image it encodes it into a feature space and then it decodes it back again into some output and in this case we're, we're using this for semantic segmentation so we're segmenting the primary root material the lateral root material and we're also using heat map regression to find the tips of all of the roots and the seed location as well. The, uh, I actually wrote a piece of software called RootNav1, unsurprisingly, uh, quite a few years ago now, and that works fine for finding paths in an image, but it won't find realistic. It won't realistically find very many tips. Um, the tip location is pretty bad, and so the problem with that means is that inevitably the, the user themselves has to click on all the roots, which is very time-consuming. So what we were trying to do with this piece of work was automate that process. So we're finding the, um, the segmentation of the root system and we're finding the tip locations. And then we use pathfinding algorithms like A-star and Dijkstra to search from the tips back to the seed or back to the primary root. And then we can reconstruct that sort of the whole root topology. And, you know, it works pretty well. Um, so this work is really an extension of this. It's given that we've got this system that can segment root systems. Is there some way we could look to augment it with temporal information? So give it three frames and see if it could predict three frames or something like this. Um, so that's where we got we, we, we started looking into generative adversarial networks. So I'll give a very brief, um, if, if, if you'll indulge me, I'll give a very brief introduction to to GANs um, for those of you that aren't familiar with them. Um, originally GANs had this kind of structure. So you have you have two networks, you have a generator, the red thing down in the bottom left, and you have a discriminator on the right hand side. These are both neural networks. Um, the generator is producing images and the discriminator is making decisions based on images. So what happens is 
we're trying i mean the actual output of this system really is we want the generator to be really really good at generating sample images right and this is one something you can use for data augmentation as well we have had a go at this um, <clears throat> so in this case what you do is you put in some random noise which is typically just literally an image of noise the generator learns to turn that random noise into a, a plausible image of whatever it is your um of you know your study is about and then the discriminator has to decide whether that's a realistic looking image or not so the discriminator the generator is always trained based on what the discriminator says and the discriminator is trained half the time on these fake images coming from the generator and half the time on the real samples coming from the real images so Essentially, the discriminator half the time sees a real image and half the time sees a fake image. And so it gets better over time at distinguishing between what's a real image and what's a fake image. And that loss is propagated backwards and trains the generator as well. Um, and the generator then gets better at producing images that can fool the discriminator. Right? But essentially, that's how it works. Now, since GANs appeared a few years ago, loads and loads of different um loads and loads of different approaches to generative adversarial networks have appeared right so cycle gan um lots of the different ones for style transfer and image generation and things like this um and you know it's a huge field but in general it always comes down to this kind of setup where you've got a discriminator or what i would call an adversarial loss that is trying to distinguish whether or not your images are sufficiently good. Right? And if they're not sufficiently good, then it, you know that loss is gonna try and help the generator learn better. Now, the good, the good thing about this is that this is essentially a, an unsupervised learning task because it, it, it's unsupervised in some sense, you don't have to annotate things because the real images can just be images. You don't have to have, there's no, there's no segmentation math or anything like this. But then that's because you're not usually solving those sorts of problems this way. Now, for this piece of work, um, we. Um, oh, here we are. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. So for this, I'm just trying to remember how my slides were set up. Um, so in this piece of work, what we're doing instead is we're taking an image sample and producing altered samples, essentially. And this is this is what CycleGAN does and what FutureGAN, which is what this is based on, does, which is very similar. Um, we take an image sample and we perform some kind of alteration to it. So, you know, something I've seen in the literature is you take a synthetic image from your domain and you try and turn it into a more realistic version of that image. So the structure of the image must remain the same. The difference between a traditional GAN, which is going from noise and this, is that the altered sample should be altered in some stylistic way, but the general structure and the objects should remain the same. And that's what CycleGAN does, for example. CycleGAN takes an image and it alters it, but it makes sure, the loss function makes sure that it can alter it back again to ensure that you're not just throwing away really important information. Um, by the way, hopefully this will also make more sense in a moment when I actually start looking at concrete examples using roots as well. Um, all right, so... Um, we can produce synthetic images and even predict future images using this setup. So essentially the difference between what we're doing here is just that we have multiple input images and we have multiple output images. Um, and we're trying to produce a stack of outputs. Right? So that's, you know, that's really all there is to it. So the setup is based on FutureGAN, right? So FutureGAN is a piece of work that, that, that exists in the literature. Um, and again, this is based on something called PGGAN, which I will talk about in a moment. Um, in, in some sense, neither of these works particularly interest me because they're a little bit outside of my area. But FutureGAN, I think, is 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 quite interesting. And there are um, there are other pieces of work to predict future frames. So what I've got this confusing image on the right hand side. Let's see if we can work out what it does. Right. You've got the input images, which actually are not grayscale. This is just for show. They're, they're actually uh, segmentation. We worked out that producing predictions of segmentation masks was easier than predicting the full image with all its weird quirks and noise and bubbles in the agar and things like this. So um, we actually directly predict 
segmentation masks from the um, segmentation masks. And also, I mean, it, from our point of view, we're trying to measure these routes anyway. So we're going to produce these segmentation masks immediately after finishing this. So it made sense just to cut out the middleman and <clears throat> go straight to the uh, masks. So we have our generator. Our generator takes a number of frames and predicts a number of future frames. Right? Um, so in this case, it might take three input frames and predict three input uh, output frames. And these are the fake future frames you can see up here on the right hand on the top right hand side. The discriminator takes a stack of input frames and then either fake or real future frames. So it, the discriminator always sees the real input frames, the three input frames, and then half the time it sees the fake future frames and half the time it sees the real future frames. Right. So if our input of our generator was three inputs and three outputs, the discriminator would be working on a stack of six in a sequence. Right? Um, and so what will happen essentially is this discriminator will get better at looking at the initial three images and the predicted images and trying to work out whether those predicted images are realistic looking or not. Now, something to bear in mind here is that GANs are trained usually on sort of perceptual loss functions and loss functions um, that try and look nice to humans. And this is something I think for future study is, is are the images being produced here biologically reasonable or are they just nice looking for humans? Now, I think in the case of roots, they're probably the same thing, but this is something to be very careful of um, because images can look very nice coming out of a GAN, but they may have weird things going on because um, because the GAN doesn't really understand any of the biology, does it? So it, so it, you know, it's just producing something that can fool the discriminator. Now, one of the other problems with GANs is that they're very, very difficult to train. Um, they're difficult to train because what you know, there's lots of different problems. But one of the problems, for example, is that the generator just learns to produce the same image over and over again. That's called mode collapse or the discriminator completely fails to learn the difference between fake and real or the generator finds it impossible to produce images sufficiently good to fool the discriminator and things like this. It's lots of different problems. And this problem gets harder as you increase the resolution of your input images. So what we do in here is we use the PG GAN approach, which is where you start with a very small network that takes a very low resolution image and produces low resolution outputs. And then you progressively add layers to the network to make it um, more higher resolution and you double the resolution each time. So you might start at a resolution of, let's say, 16 by 16, and then you go to 32 by 32, 64, 128, and so on. And theoretically, you can you can um, push this as far as you want, all right, within reason. We stopped at 128, which is quite low resolution for this study, but got the proof of concept. So we train this for a while, and then we add layers to the encoder decoder, and we train again at a higher resolution. So the weights from the top are copied over to the bottom, and then new weight, new layers are added in which are then retrained. Right? And it's easier to train a GAN like this a little bit at a time. Right? This is the kind of thing um, that will help. And then we do this again and we do it again and until our GAN is sufficiently uh, high resolution, but it solves the problem we want to solve. Right? That's essentially how it works. So it's, it's really a combination of two pieces of work. We've got future GAN that is predicting real and uh, future frames. And we've got the PG GAN, which is progressively moving to high resolution. For me, PG GAN is very much an applied thing that you would use if you had trouble training at high resolution. It, in and of itself, it doesn't do anything specifically. It just helps you train. So this is um, based on the um, Komatsuna data set, which is um, essentially a leaf segmentation challenge that exists in the literature. And in here, what we were doing is we were taking the, the previous six frames and then predicting six future frames. Right? And you can see essentially, well, you can, you know, you can see, but it is, it is kind of doing it right. The, so the lower set of images are the ground truth of the future frames against the predicted sequence. Um, and you can see that it is plausibly to an extent it is growing these leaves as you might expect. Now, some leaves work better than others, right? You can see the yellow one 
Um, it kind of changes shape and that kind is kind of good. The very small leaves, and I'll talk about them in a moment, don't really work because there's very little information to go on. Now, I should say here that what this is doing is producing a segmentation mask, not an original image. So the output is literally what you see here, this predicted sequence, right? Which from my point of view is fine because um, I actually want to measure the sizes of leaves and, and other things like this anyway. If you wanted to produce realistic look looking images for obviously data augmentation, you would perhaps generate real realistic looking images instead, which could which could well be a harder problem. Um, on the left hand side, by the way, the example images, they come with depth data. Uh, this data set include depth. We're, we're not using depth for this study. Um, so this is what the this is what the results look like. Um, you can see there's a pretty good correlation. I mean, pretty good is, is my you know, non scientific term for this right um the the accuracy of the segmentation doesn't decrease particularly across the across the time series right the, the leaves grow plausibly each frame and they continue to do so you can see that the error where the leaves are very small is, is you know is much much higher there isn't i would argue not a particularly strong correlation down here on the bottom left um where the leaves are small or they're occluded by other leaves the GAN doesn't really do a particularly good job of working out what they're going to do into the future. The leaves are already well established. Their sizes do track much, much more um, closely with what we would expect. You can see there's been a few failure cases on the left hand side here, but just essentially don't, you know, it produces no output or something like this. Right. And this is this is typical of a GAN. This will happen from time to time. Um, so. This was our first test. This has nothing to do with roots. You might have noticed after I spoke about root nav. Um, this was our first test. The second test is what we did on our, on root nav. Um, so <clears throat> one of the problems we have with these future frames is that we have all these sequences of Arabidopsis plates, but we don't actually have um, any segmentations for these hundreds and hundreds of images. Um, because they've never been annotated by, uh, you know, these were captured automatically, they were used for some study, and they don't actually have full annotations. So what we did instead was the next best thing, we used RootNav2 to annotate all of these images, and then we could work with the segmentation masks. So bear in mind that the segmentation we're predicting here is output from RootNav2 in some sense, and will have its little quirks as well. The segmentation of RootNav2 is pretty good, but it's not obviously not perfect. So, you know, that's something to bear in mind. So we use RootNav2 to predict ground truth output for all of the frames, and then we can go through and um, correct the obviously incorrect images. And then we train the GAN to predict future frames. Now, what we're doing then is we're trying to, we're, I mean, this green, these green bits here, this is what we're, we're, we're kind of starting to look at, but obviously more work is required on measuring growth trends and things like this. This is the idea, is to build this into RootNav2. This isn't something we've done yet as, as of this work. Um, so we have RootNav2 trained up on normal Arabidopsis images. We run it all the way over this data set. We produce loads of output, and then we train our future GAN, just like we did with the um, Comet Sooner data set. Um, Oh, I've got an extra slide on this, right? Um, but in case you're interested, this is the the citation at the bottom here. This is the um, original work that produced the infrared images of um, of Arabidopsis. In case you know the data set is interesting to you, um, <clears throat> the only other thing I would say is that we're producing color images out of RootNav2 with with different classes of root and tips located, you know, using different colors. Um, and we're predicting that we're not just predicting black and white um, because I think it's more interesting that way. And also it has more relevance to RootNav2. Um, so this is this is an example of the output. Um, in general, you can see these are the first three frames. And then you've got some, I would argue, plausible growth coming out of the next um, three fr frames. So these are two different examples. The top and the bottom and then you've got the input frames three input frames and the three output frames so we're not going six in and six out because our sequences are shorter and also we found that um this does not track as well the, the, the comet sooner data set is in some sense easier 
we found that if you start to try and predict too far in the future, you know, you're going to be starting to make up things, right? Um, I mean, let's, it's doing that anyway, but it starts to fall down a little bit. Um, so, you know, it looks reasonably good, I think, right? This is very, very preliminary work, right? There's a lot more, um, there's a lot more work to do here to work out, you know, how biologically helpful this will be, right? And I think from a modeling point of view, if this is a question that needs to be answered, um, but, you know, in principle, this kind of generative adversarial network can be used to predict a few frames in advance, which hypothetically could shave a few days off your experimental cycle, which would be, you know, very useful if um, if we could do it. Um, so we obtained uh, intersection of union scores to measure how how well the accuracy. So it's a quantitative measure of how um, accurate this network is. And we're comparing these to, again, the root nav two ground truth predicted for the future frames. And I would ignore the intersection over union on the background because essentially the majority of the images background is not a helpful metric. The intersection over union of the root is, is the most interesting and it's sort of 0.55. Now, this will be a combination of roots in the wrong place, but mostly this will be a combination of slight thickness differences and quirks with the root system. Intersection over union on thin structures like this is very sensitive to if your root is one pixel to the left, then you suddenly have half the root on the background and, and you can lose a lot of accuracy that way. But a, 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 a much more, I think what's required now after this study is a much more thorough look at what the failure modes are. Is it producing plausible biological root systems? Because of course that's what's important, right? I mean, some researchers work with models of root systems anyway, and you know, as long as, as long as they're sort of parameterized based on something real, that can be helpful. So we have to see how it goes. Um, all right. So where, where, what do I think we achieved, and what do I think we need to do now? Right. Um, and you know, do ask questions because um, you'll, I'm sure you'll have some. Um, we've shown that in principle. Generative adversarial networks can be used to predict future frames in the growth of plants, right? So but I think this is an interesting thing to explore because it could reduce experimental cycles. It could produce lots more training data. If you've got sequences of images, you can fill in images in between, you know, like a higher resolution or something like this, increase the amount of data you've got in this way. And maybe it doesn't have to be biologically perfect if you're going to do that. Maybe it just has to be realistic looking. <clears throat> The future frames align well to the ground truth and we have good accuracy scores, but I think we, we have more to do to prove that this is a biologically accurate um, growth prediction rather than a nice looking growth prediction in the segmentation space. Um, so what do I think we should do now? Well, um, and this is be bearing in mind that Rebeo has left the university, so I have to try and get funding to bring him back and then we can do some of this. Um, but this is, you know, it's early work. What are the quantitative benefits of this kind of approach over more traditional prediction of growth? If you just measure the length of the primary route for the first three frames, can you just, you know, fit a line and predict the growth over the next three frames, right? My gut tells me that, so we, I mean, this is, we haven't answered this question. This is a question that really must be answered. Um, my gut tells me that in something like leaf dynamics, you have the ability to predict something slightly more complicated than just a function that increases the size of some number um, because of it, you know, you, the, the GAN can incorporate shape information and other things, right? But we haven't proved this yet. And this is something really important that we need to show. Um, will this adapt to more complex imaging scenarios? So some of these GANs that you see in the literature are producing incredibly realistic looking images in lots of different domains. Can we push this to produce plants growing over time in real images rather than segmented images? We probably can. We might need more data right? it, it, and, you know, training it will be difficult. Um, we haven't got a measure yet of how far. So this was sort of experimentally driven. How far can we predict into the future? Right? You know, can we predict three a week into the future, two weeks? It, this is this is the way to be seen. Right? And um, and my last thing was, and I, my camera is right in the middle of my slide. Uh, oh, yes. 
So I, I can see it now. Um, yes, resolution is a problem. So generative adversarial networks are very, very computationally demanding because you've literally got two networks. So at the very least, they're double, but they're often more than this. And I think what's important is trying to improve the resolution of these some more. You can use something like PGGAN, you can use some of the new GANs that can produce higher resolution outputs, but for very detailed biological imaging, this isn't a solved problem and something we should look at. So thanks very much. Um, I will leave it there and perhaps you know take any questions that you have. Uh, I, I appreciate you inviting me here today to talk about the random experiments that we do. <laughs>